Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Inside Scientific webinar entitled Identification and Classification of Tongue Innervating Mechanoreceptors. My name is Darius Sulam from the events team here at Scientist.com, and I'll be your host today. This webinar has been sponsored by Aurora Scientific, so a big thanks to them for helping make this webinar possible. Our speaker today is Dr. Yalda Moyedi, Assistant Professor in the Departments of Neurology, Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Columbia University in New York City. In just a few moments, Yalda will be presenting her recent findings on tongue innervating mechanoreceptors. I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Yalda Moyedi. Thanks so much for joining us today, Yalda. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Darius. Um, so first, thank you for coordinating this and thank you to Inside Scientific and Aurora Scientific for inviting me to present my work and to all of you for, um, for being here today and uh, listening in. Uh, so the work that I'm going to present today started when I was a postdoc in Ellen Lumpkin's lab at Columbia University, and now I'm continuing this work in my own lab at Columbia as well, uh, here in New York City. So eating a, is, of course, essential for life by providing nutrition, but the physical act of eating a delicious meal and sharing it with our loved ones is one of life's greatest pleasures. So what is it about food that brings us so much enjoyment? When we describe our favorite foods, words that might come to mind could reflect their taste attributes like salty or sweet, or their aromatic qualities like the smell of a freshly baked bread. We often think of these chemosensory attributes of foods when we, just, when we describe them, but what about textural features like crunchiness, viscosity, or, or compliance? For me, I love a really nice firm tomato, but when that same tomato is just a little bit too soft, it's completely inedible. So these kinds of oral textural, texture perceptual um, features are very important for food hedonics, yet we know comparatively little about the neurons and circuits that transduce these, uh, these food textures. So this understanding the basic biology of these neurons that underlie oral mechanosensation sensation has really broad implications beyond just flavor. So as we chew our foods, we rely on central pattern generators that are modified by feedback of sensory neurons to ensure that food is kept in place. When we're then ready to swallow, unlike this hamster here, mechanosensation is used to assess whether the bolus is of the right size and salivary content to swallow without injury. When that bolus is then ready, mechanosensory cues are thought to contribute to both the initiation and propagation of swallow. When these same sensory motor systems that underlie feeding go awry, they can result in dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, and this has huge clinical implications, affecting around 15 million people in the U.S. and contributing to nearly 60,000 deaths a year. So outside of feeding, tongue mechanoreceptors are used in uh, conspecific social behaviors as well, like in humans for generating speech and for animals that grim themselves for uh, self and social grooming. And so despite, despite these many important functions, we know really little about the mechanosensory cells and molecules that mediate oral behaviors. And so this is really the primary focus of my lab. Uh, so the data that I'm going to show you today is our attempt to dissect the function of mechanosensory neurons and oral behaviors. And I've really asked three key questions here to get at this. First, what neurons are present? Second, what do these neurons sense? And third, how do they impact function? Now, to identify mechanosensory neurons and oral tissues, we drew from what is known about skin mechanoreceptors. Now in the skin, we know that there are different anatomical endings, which are called end organs, and these encode different percepts when stimulated. So for example, uh, encapsulated neural, neuronal endings like the Meissner's corpuscle respond really well to vibrations and encode a sensation of flutter. Merkel cell neurite complexes that you can see here encode coarse textures, fine shapes, and prolong like stimuli, like the feeling of your shirt resting against your skin. Epithelia also have these free nerve endings that you can see here on the right, and these tend to transduce noxious stimuli like high force pressures, thermal, and chemical stimulations. So these mechanosensory neurons uh, highlighted on the left that transduce discriminative touch tend to be myelinated. And as such, we can distinguish th those from these unmyelinated free nerve endings with antibodies for neuroflamin tepi. And so to identify the anatomical substrates of oral mechanosensation, I performed histological experiments of the tongue, hard palate, and back of the hard palate in humans and mice taking advantage of these features. And so first we'll look at the tongue, which is generally considered a taste organ. There are three varieties of taste papilla that speckle the tongue. However, the majority of the tongue is covered by these non-taste papilla called filiform papilla. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna focus in on the anterior two thirds of the tongue 
and begin by discussing the fungiform papilla that populate this region. So we collected biopsies from healthy human volunteers near the tip of the tongue and performed immunohistochemistry to localize the topography of uh, somatosensory endings that innervate this region. And so we took cross sections from these biopsies, shown here staying with a nuclear marker to reveal their anatomy. And this allowed us to clearly uh, distinguish fungiform papilla based on their relative size and epithelial structure. And one, uh, one fungiform papilla is highlighted here. So taste buds reside within the apical tip of the uh, fungiform papilla outlined with this dotted box, uh, which is where we're going to focus it on first. And so we stain with markers for all neurons in magenta, myelinated neurons in yellow, and taste cells in blue. So here you can see a really nice taste bud at the uh, uh, near the tip of the fungiform papilla, and that's out outlined with a with a blue dotted line throughout the talk. Uh, also throughout the talk, I'm going to use a white dotted line to denote the epithelial laminal propria border, and that's the uh, connective tissue below the epithelium. So interestingly, we identified a familiar end organ that had not yet been described in the human tongue, and you can see that here, and that's called the Meisner's corpuscle. Um, and as I mentioned for, before, these endings uh, consist of a myelinated neuron, uh, which is in fact intertwined with an unmyelinated neuron, and these terminate together within a corpuscle. So this type of ending responds best to vibrations and encodes a sensation of flutter when stimulated. And so in your mouth, this would be like the sensation that you feel when you move your tongue across your teeth. When we then looked at taste buds, you'll first notice that there are these really high densities of uh, neuronal endings that sit just below the taste buds. And so these would include neurons that relay taste information to the brain. You'll also notice that there, these uh, unmyelinated endings extend into the overlying epithelium that you can see here. So these would include uh, an unmyelinated, unmyelinated endings that convey pain temper and temperature sensations to the brain. We looked then for the a marker for myelinated neurons. Remember, these tend to be mechanosensory and found that these endings were embedded in the epithelium surrounding the taste buds, that you can see here, within the taste buds themselves, and, in, and also terminating below the taste buds. And so I wanted to test whether these express the molecules necessary for mechanosensation. And to do this, I looked at expression of piezo2, which is the principal mechanosensory ion channel in mammals. And in fact, just last year, Arden Patapunian received a Nobel Prize in part for his work in discovering this channel and its many functions throughout the body. So to do this, we turned to the mouse as a model system and we used a transgenic line that the Patapudian lab developed in which piezo2 protein is marked by a, a fluorescent molecule allowing us to monitor expression of this channel. What we found in this system is that neurons that terminated in the apical epithelium surrounding the taste buds were piezo2 positive. And in fact, they form these really beautiful starburst-like endings. And so when I found this, I was really excited to, to see this as the structure of mechanosensory ending has not been described in the literature prior to this. And so it represents a really novel type of neuron that I'm enthusiastic to invest, investigate the function of in my lab. We also noticed PSO2 expression around the base of the taste buds here. And then if you look at this monochrome image, you can see it also speckles within the taste bud itself. And so these can signify that there are other mechanosensory endings in this region. So we next looked at non-taste sensitive filiform papilla. Now the dogma in the literature is that these are the primary mechanosensitive organs of the tongue, yet few studies have actually tested this directly and none have identified the bona fide uh, mechanosensory end organs within them. And so uh, filiform papilla can be seen here on the right and these can be identified based on their relative size difference and their epithelial structure. So in humans, we found that the predominant neuronal ending type uh, it, within the filiform papilla were these, uh, what are called end bulbs of Croissa, and these are not very well characterized. And so these were found often, often in the clusters of several bulbs within a single filiform papilla. So in the literature, these have been described as either being cold receptors or mechanoreceptors, but they have not been uh, recorded from directly, so it's unclear which one they actually are. They're often found in areas that experience high shear force, like the leading edge of the bat wing and the snout of the dog. And based on their structure and localization, we hypothesize that these endings are indeed mechanosensory. And so we tested this by comparing structures in mice. And we found that unlike in humans, mice have these uh, single clusters of myelinated neurons within each filiform papilla. So we asked whether these clusters are encapsulated as they are in humans by looking at a marker of Schwann cells. Uh, 
and we found that indeed they are. So we concluded that these are homologous to the end bulbs of Croissa found in uh, human filiform papilla, but in mice, these endings are much less elaborate. When we looked for piezo 2 expression in these endings, we found that indeed they also express this mechanosensory ion channel, and you can see that here. And it, it, it concentrates within the filiform papilla, uh, and that can be seen really well in this monochrome image. So we concluded that indeed these endings are likely to be the mechanosensory uh, neurons of the filiform papilla. And so in to summarize this region, in, human, in the human frontiform papilla, I found the presence of occasional Meisner's corpuscles. Again, these would be the vibration detectors, as well as the presence of both unmyelinated neurons and myelinated neurons denoted in green. Uh, and these myelinated neurons surround the taste buds as well. In mice, we didn't find these Meisner's corpuscles, but we did find conserved myelinated structures that express piezo 2 surrounding taste, uh, taste buds. In filiform papilla, the predominant neuronal ending I identified were these end bulbs of Croissa in humans. And we also found nearby unmyelinated afferents. And in mice, we see really similar endings uh, as humans, but we found that these end bulbs of Croissa uh, express piezo 2 as well, and were not quite as elaborate. So now I want to switch over for a few slides to talk about the other important surface for detecting food textures, and that's the hard palate. So if you look at this video of a person undergoing fluoroscopy while eating and focus on the movements of the food during chewing, you'll notice that the tongue pushes food against the hard palate, which allows both surfaces to mutually assess texture, textural features. So in fact, common flavor features like astringency and fats are amplified by this interaction between these surfaces. So we asked, what is the anatomy of uh, mechanoreceptors in the hard palate? So I focused in on the rugae um, outlined in this, by this red box on the left. And these are the, uh, these are the ridges at the front of your hard palate. So if you just uh, take a moment to touch this region with your tongue, you may notice how exquisitely sensitive it is to touch. So again, we started with a marker for myelinated neurons and included a marker for Merkel cells as well. And you'll see that within the rugal ridges, there are these epithelial pegs with invaginations of lamina propria between them. And we found that Meisner's corpuscles really sit at the apical tips of these, uh, these pegs, close to the outer, outermost surface of the epithelium. And so, so that'll be towards the top of this image. So these would likely detect vibrations, such as those that you'd feel when your tongue is light, lightly brushed up against the roof of your mouth. At the base of these epithelial pegs, we also found clusters of Merkel cells. And when we looked in at higher magnification at these Merkel cells, we found that they are really well innervated by my, uh, myelinated neurons as they are in the skin. And collectively, this mechanosensory Merkel cell and their mechanosensory myelinated afferent are called the Merkel cell neurite -right complex. And when these complexes are stimulated, they encode fine textural features and sustain pressure. And so this would be like what, what you would feel when you, your tongue just rests against the roof of your mouth. And so in mice, we found a really similar organization of hard palate rugae with mechanosensory corpuscles in the apical uh, lamina propria ridges and Merkel cell neurite complexes lying in the base of those ridges seen here. So there's a second type of ending present in the hard palate of humans and mice, and these are called glomerular endings. So these consist of several neuronal endings forming an unstructured bundle at the apical tips of lamina propria. So these glomerular endings have been hypothesized to detect shear, but no one has actually recorded from these neurons during stimulation, thus this has yet to be tested. And so remarkably, when we look at the overall distribution of mechanosensory endings in the mammalian hard palate, we find a really similar arrangement as that of other high acuity regions, such as the ready ridges at the fingertips. And so these are the, um, your fingerprints, basically. So um, this arrangement consists of Merkel cell neurite complexes at the base of these, the epithelium and corpuscles uh, jutting into the lamina propria uh, between the ridges. And so we hypothesize that this arrangement confers the hard palate rugae with high touch acuity that facilitates both feeding and speech. And so in our anatomical studies, we've identified a diverse array of putative mechanosensory endings in both the tongue and the hard palate. But what really remains unknown here is what features of stimuli do these neuron classes detect? And importantly, how do these different classes of neural, neuronal endings convey textual features to relay a unified version of food qualities 
like that this chip is uh, greasy and uh, crispy versus compliant and dry. And so this leads into my second key question, which is what is the functional diversity of oral mechanosensory endings? Now, this is a fascinating question because we know that in the skin, there's a broad anatomical array of neurons, each encoding different features of touch. And this coding is based on the physiology of those neuron classes. And so um, neurons that transduce light touch are often called low threshold mechanoreceptors. Uh, and this means that they have a low threshold of activation to force. In other words, a very light touch will activate these neurons. So these include uh, the corpuscles that I mentioned earlier uh, that tend to transduce vibrations to encode a sensation of flutter. So these corpuscular endings respond really well to the onset and the offset of pressure. And this neuron type is called rapidly adapting, meaning that it adapts to pressure. Neurons that respond in this way tend to have really, or tend to be really good movement detectors as they're tuned to detect changes. Merkel cell neuron complexes, on the other hand, transduce sustained pressures really well uh, that help us to encode shapes and textures. And so these have physiological uh, responses as, that are active uh, as long as pressure is provided. And this is a response type that's called slowly adapting. So these low threshold mechanosensory uh, endings contrast from high threshold mechanoreceptors, which, uh, which are neurons that, that respond to forces in the noxious range, like what you'd experience when you're pinched or poked. So what about in the tongue where we have this really unique uh, cadre of, of neuronal end organs and uh, with different morphologies, and we have very uh, little data on what these mechanosensory neuron classes do. And so Matt Trollson and Greg Essick sought to identify the characteristics of mechanosensory neurons intervening in the mouth in a series of beautiful plate papers. So in this work, they recorded directly from nerve fibers innervating the, the tongue in humans. And they found that tongue mechanoreceptors included both rapidly adapting and slowly adapting low threshold mechanoreceptors, uh, as well as some proprioceptor populations. And so this provided some of the first insights to the functional properties of lingual uh, mechanoreceptors. So while this technique is exceptionally informative as it allows us to study mechanoreceptors in living humans, it does come with some technical limitations, including relatively low throughput and a slight bias towards certain subtypes of mechanoreceptors. So I wondered if we were there, there were additional types of mechanoreceptors that, that hadn't been defined in these studies. So to go a step further, it, I used recently developed high throughput molecular imaging techniques to identify subtypes of lingual mechanosensory neurons. And so for these uh, experiments, I used mice as a model system, and these mice express GCAMP in sensory neurons. And this is a genetically encoded calcium indicator that fluoresces in the presence of calcium. Uh, and so this allows us to monitor the activity of hundreds of neurons in real time in a living animal through the use of fluorescent microscopy. So I uh, developed a method to image the trigeminal ganglia in response to tongue stimulation. And I focused in on the trigem as it carries the bulk of somatosensory information from the tongue to the brain. I imaged directly from the ganglia of a head fixed animal whose tongue was stabilized to a platform. I applied either force controlled indention to give precise mechanical stimulation to the tongue or thermal stimulation while calcium responses were simultaneously recorded. I'll show you here some example experiments where I applied either a pressure or cold flowing water directly to the tongue. Now remember that the, the the uh, trigeminal ganglia conveys both mechanosensory and thermal information to the brain. So in these, these videos uh, are going to be, they're, they're pseudocolored so that baseline fluorescence is in blue and an increase in relative fluorescence is color scaled with red at the highest. So we find that when the tongue is indented, there are, are robust calcium responses that you can see here. And that increase in calcium indicates that the neuron is firing uh, action potentials. I'll let that play one more time. So you can see that the array of neurons that responded, uh, this array of neurons that responded particularly well through a maximum projection image that, that you can see here. So in this same field of view on the right, you'll see what happens when cold water is flowed over the, over the tongue. And what you'll notice is there, there's a different cluster of neurons that respond to cold. And so these would be similar to what was previously published by both Steve Roper and Charles Zucker's labs. 
Now, you can really appreciate that the complementive neurons responding to pressure and cold flow are different by comparing the maximum projections uh, in the stimulation windows here. One feature that you may also notice is that the neurons that responded to pressure appear to be larger than those responding to cold. And in fact, this is a general feature of this matasensory system that the cell body size of uh, the ganglion neurons, that, uh, that the size tends to correlate with function. So we performed experiments where we first gave a series of five 10 second force controlled indentions ranging from very light touch to the noxious range. We followed this by uh, flowing cool room temperature water over the tongue um, and then ice cold water over the tongue. So here I'll show you data from each of these conditions and sample traces. And so at baseline, we see that the neurons are really silent within the, um, and then when we perform uh, indentation, you'll see that there's that a subset of neurons respond. Um, and by the uh, representative traces, you'll see that these neuron, these uh, responses initiate really quickly at the start of stimulation and then turn off at differing time points. So this indicates that there are likely different adaptation properties in these neurons. When we flow room temperature water on, we see a really different subset of neurons that respond. And finally, with cold flow, we see that there are indeed um, additional neurons that respond. Um, so by compiling data from many experiments, where we, we what we can see is that about 83% of neurons that we recorded from responsive to cool or cold flow, um, about 8% responded only to mechanical stimulation and 9% were responsive to both. So this indicates around 17% of neurons that we recorded from were pressure responsive. Now, when we look at cell body size of the responding neurons, as um, again, we know from the cutaneous system that uh, somatosensory neuron cell body size correlates with response modalities with where the smaller neurons tend to be thermal and nociceptive and large diameter neurons tend to be mechanosensory or proprioceptive. And we found that indeed the smallest neurons were cold flow sensitive or polymodal, whereas neurons that were mechanosensory only were significantly larger than the other two groups. So we conclude from this that the tongue trigeminal system seems to follow the same rules as the cutaneous system in this regard. So we next asked, what kind of stimuli do, do uh, tongue innervating kinesensory neurons encode? And so in these experiments, we applied the same series of five forces, but then we brushed 10 times from posterior to anterior, and then uh, 10 times from anterior to posterior. So the data, uh, the compiled data can be appreciated really well through these heat maps. And so here you'll see that each line on the y-axis represents the response of a single neuron and time is shown on the x-axis. We again have uh, relative fluorescence color scaled as before with uh, baseline as blue and red at peak. And so we found that the vast majority of neurons responded to brush, about 5% responded only to pressure and 23% responded to both. Now, when you look at these pressure responses closely, what you may notice is that there are very different qualitative responses to pressure application. And this is uh, this difference in response dynamics can be really appreciated here with representative force traces. So some neurons responded throughout the duration of the stimulation, like this neuron seen in purple, while others responded with only transient peaks, as uh, seen here in uh, blue. So if you focus here on the highest force given shown here, you can see that, the, that there's a really obvious difference between response patterns. And this is a really important finding, as you may remember from before, in the cutaneous system, the way that a neuron responds to this type of ramp and hold force tells us about the identity of that neuron and the kinds of stimuli that it's really tuned to detect. So we would expect that these groups uh, would detect different features of stimuli, like prolonged pressure and vibration, respectively. So from these data, we can conclude that there is indeed functional diversity of tongue innervating mechanosensory neurons. But this brings up two additional questions. First, how many functionally distinct populations are there? And secondly, can we identify markers for these populations? So to answer these questions, I surveyed transgenic mouse lines that mark functionally distinct mechanosensory neurons that innervate the skin for whether they also mark uh, distinct groups of mechanosensory neurons in the tongue. And so today I'll show you data from three of these lines. 
So here I'm showing you the trigeminal ganglia from, from each of these lines. The yellow labels neurons that are marked by each Cree line, and magenta marks individual neurons. So the first one we tested was the GDNF receptor RET, which we um, and, and we chose this inducible RET Cree line as we thought it would label most low threshold mechanosensory neurons. And as you can see from this, it labels about um, really about a third of somatosensory neurons. The second line we tested was this uh, VLUT3 Cree line, which in the skin marks more specific subsets of mechanoreceptors, including Merkel cell afferents and brush sensitive neurons that, uh, that innervate um, hair follicles, as well as a population of cold sensitive neurons. Finally, we chose um, NTREC3 as it labels predominantly the largest mechanoreceptors like Merkel cell afferents and proprioceptors. And as you can see here, only labels rare, uh, uh, very rare populations of neurons in the trigeminal ganglia. So we performed uh, in vivo imaging um, analysis of these neurons as we did before for each uh, for each Cree line. And I know there's a lot to take in on this slide, but what I hope you can appreciate from these uh, heat maps is that the majority of neurons in all groups are very brush sensitive. However, neurons from different molecular markers seems to have seem to have different response dynamics to pressure. So some neurons are are, uh, are mostly transient. Uh, have mostly transient responses to pressure, while others have the sustained response type to pressure. So at this point, we wanted to know whether different markers correlate with different functional response groups, or whether they mark overlapping populations. And so when deciding how to address this question, we took a step back and realized that although these sorts of in vivo imaging techniques for analyzing neurons are really powerful and sophisticated, the common analysis methods for classifying neurons um, are not necessarily this this uh, high tech, and so they can they are generally done by visual categorization of neurons. And so we, we decided we wanted to develop a less biased approach, and to do this, we teamed with Greg Erling, who's a systems engineer in University of Virginia, and a student Sean Zhu. So we devised a computational approach to categorize cells based on response properties of pressure, and uh, Sean was completely blinded to genotype for all analysis. Uh, she then took a raw time series signals of all collected neurons that were first cleaned to remove noise, baseline drift, and amplitude discrepancies. And she applied a hierarchical clustering algorithm uh, to the clean data in a two-layer structure. And so this provided an unbiased way to cluster groups and allowed us to rigorously ask whether these molecular markers label distinct or overlapping subsets of mechanosensory neurons. And so from the, this approach, we found that there were five unequally representative groups in our data for of uh, tongue innervated mechanosensory and trigeminal neurons. And you can see those five represented here by average traces of their responses to the highest force level. So in this uh, scheme, the onset and the offset of pressure application is indicated by two dotted lines. And what you can appreciate from these average traces is that the responses, uh, that the, the groups are qualitative uh, quite different, with differences in response kinetics, amplitude, and direction. Now, I'll go through some of the group features uh, for what we found. So cluster one, which was the rarest group, consists of neurons that have a sustained response to pressure that's active throughout the duration of the stimulation. And so to quantify these qualitative properties, we extracted the maximum peak at the beginning of stimulation, and that's indicated by the white bar below the response series. As well, uh, as well as the average response at steady state indicated by the olive bar for each uh, mechanical stimulation applied. Um, and so this allowed us to quantify both the force response relationship at peak and whether or not these cells adapt to pressure. And so we found that this group is pressure encoding across the entire series given, meaning that as force increases, the maximum response also increases. We see that the force response relation at peak is indistinguishable indistinguishable from steady state, indicating that these neurons do, adapt, uh, do, do not adapt to force in this time frame. We also see that this group is really better encoding um, uh, pressure than it is at brush. Um, now, what's particularly interesting about this, uh, the rarity of this group is that we would expect this to be a significant population of, of mechanoreceptors in the cutaneous system, but here we see it's only 5%. So what this suggests is that the mouse uh, tongue is really well adapted for sensing sustained pressure, uh, or is not well adapted for sensing sustained pressure, like what you'd feel when the tongue is resting against the hard palate. Uh, 
So this was really unexpected. We would also expect a neuron that responds in this way to be either a Merkel cell neurite complex or a Ruffini ending. But um, through our anatomical analysis, we found that neither of these types of, of endings were present in the mouse tongue. And so the end organ type from which this uh, response derives from is still completely unknown. So cluster two neurons, which were the most abundant group, responded with a transient increase in calcium fluorescence to both the onsets and the offsets of pressure application. When we look at the force response relations, we find that they did not encode force well. They only had a slightly positive slope on the force response um, curves. At steady state, the, the, the response was actually near zero, indicating these neurons adaptive force quite rapidly. You can see that these neurons are, are more responsive to, uh, to brushing than they are to pressure, which collectively suggests that, that they would be great at encoding moving stimuli. So we would expect that the, these types of encap these would be a type of encapsulated ending, which may, um, which may in fact be the end bulbs of Poisa found in the mouse tongue. And you can surmise that they could uh, detect things like flowing liquids or grooming. Cluster three neurons displayed a, a transient response to high force application. And what you'll see here when you look at the force response relations is that they encoded high force really well, but did not have um, very high peaks to low forces. And so this indicates that they have a higher threshold for activation and are most likely mechanonociceptors. And so these would detect painful mechanical stimuli, stimulation of the tongue. As expected by the high force threshold, these neurons responded better to high forces than they did to brushing. Um, and so these would most likely be a form of mechanonociceptor. Cluster 4A neurons um, account accounted for almost 40% of responders. This group didn't respond well to pressure at all. Um, they didn't encode force very well at all, but they were in fact very brush sensitive. And so this overrepresentation of these highly brush sensitive neurons in the tongue's, tongue uh, here and in cluster uh, two really attests the importance of moving stimulation to the mouse tongue. The final cluster I think is particularly interesting. It actually shows a slight increase in calcium followed by an inhibition to pressure. So this cluster was initially part of group four, but was pulled out as a unique class from our hierarchical clustering approach. So the initial peak did not encode force well, as you can see from the uh, peak response curves. But the study state four showed a significant negative slope to increasing force. And so despite having a negative response to pressure, these, these, this cluster was very brush sensitive, as you can see here. So as you can imagine, this is not a common response pattern in the periphery. So I'm actually really interested in finding out the mechanisms underlying inhibition to pressure in these cells and the functional consequences of this response type. Um, during behaviors. So overall, what you can see from this data are that most uh, neurons that innervate the tongue have a transient response type, and only a small fraction have a sustained response type. In addition to this, most, most neurons are very brush sensitive, and this really tells us how well the tongue is tuned to detect moving stimuli, like what you'd experience when you're actively grooming, grooming or actively feeding. So the second major finding is that only a small fraction of neurons encode force well. And so this suggests that sustained forces sensed directly through the tongue are not the most important mechanical features that the tongue experiences. And based on our anatomical findings of the abundance of Merkel cells in the heart palate, we would actually suspect that that surface would be much better at encoding pressure. And so our next question was whether there are anatomical or molecular correlates to individual neuron clusters. And so we look next at the cell body size. Um, as I mentioned before, we know that in the cutaneous system, cell body size tends to correlate with function, where the uh, largest diameter neurons tend to be proprioceptors, or low threshold mechanoceptors, meter, medium diameter neurons tend to be cold sensitive nociceptors, and smaller neurons tend to be nociceptors, thermoreceptors, or chemo, um, chemoreceptors. And so we looked at the distribution of sizes and found that throughout the light, the cell body size of our clusters do tend to follow this pattern. So the sustained cluster one and transient clusters were um, the largest diameter neurons, and then nociceptors and negative going responders were um, significantly smaller than the first two groups.
So we next asked if the clusters we identified were molecularly distinct. So to do this, we looked at the molecular markers represented in each cluster, which I'm showing you on the right here. So what you can see here is that each molecular uh, marker is present in four out of five of the clusters. But to our excitement, we found that three groups had really different distinct patterns of representation. So cluster one neurons that you can see here highlighted in purple were RET positive, NTREC3 positive, but VGLUT3 negative. So this is a similar distribution as the response patterns that we would expect from cutaneous mechanosensory uh, neurons expressing these two markers. Cluster three was RET positive, VGLUT3 positive, but NTREC3 negative. And again, this is in keeping with what we know about molecular expression and nociceptors in the cutaneous system. Finally, cluster 4B was VGLUT3 positive, NTREC3 positive, and RET negative. Um, and so this is also a very interesting uh, distribution of molecular markers. So when we performed chi-square tests, we found that the, indeed the representations of molecular markers in clusters 1, 3, and 4B were significantly different from what the total data that was input, indica indicating that these are uh, significant differences in molecular representations. And so these markers suggest that although each molecular label marks uh, several different clusters, three of the clusters can be distinguished based on the combination of labels present. So ne we're now working on get, uh, generating intersectional approaches to genetically target these three groups, so we can then study their functions and flavor perception and other oral behaviors. So this brings me to the final key question that we're approaching my lab, which is how mechanosensation impacts oral function uh, during our lifetime. And so as we age, we experience drastic changes in our feeding styles and preferences. So we move from suckling to eating mushy, plain foods to uh, consuming a high diversity of tastes and textures. And then unfortunately, with advanced age, many seniors will also experience disorders of swallow that may cause them to modify the foods that they consume. So at the same time points when feeding issues arise, we also see decreased point discrimination and increased mechanical thresholds on oral surfaces. So I asked whether a change in sensory topology correlated with these declines. And so to answer this question, we focused on the Merkel Salmonite complex. Now, as you may remember from before, these endings are present in the palate rugae. And we took advantage of a mouse line that expresses laxity in Merkel cells to track the density of, and distribution of uh, Merkel cells in adult and aging mice. So, in adult mice, we see a really nice dis distribution of blue laxy expression in discrete puncta along the, the hard palate rugae. Um, when mice are aged for a year or more, these puncta are replaced by disparate blobs on the rugae. So we measure the density of puncta along the rugae and found a significant decline in Merkel cell density in aged hard palates compared to adults. Um, we next asked whether this loss of Merkel cells results in a decline in function. So for these experiments, we turn to a preference assay, assay called a gustometer. So we, uh, for these experiments, we trained mice to drink from a brief access window. Um, mice were then food and water restricted to promote caloric eating and presented with an oily emulsion on test day. So we chose oils as we suspected that Merkel cells would be particularly tuned to detect mouth coating, uh, as well as viscosity that, that oily oils um, confer upon food. We used a mouse line where Merkel cells are selectively ablated, and this allowed us to, uh, to circumvent other compounds of aging. So we first found that mice that lacked Merkel cells overall initiated fewer trials when presented with this oily emulsion, and this suggested that they may not perceive the Oil, um, the oil is caloric. We also found that while control mice had a mild preference for oily emulsion, shown, um, shown here in this graph, um, where oil uh, licks for oil are normalized to licks for water, meaning that one signifies no preference in comparison to water. So the median lick count for control mice sits around two, indicating that normal, uh, normal mice lick twice as much um, oil as compared to water. On the right in red, you'll see that mice that lack Merkel cells showed a significantly lower preference for oily liquid um, uh, with a median near one. So this indicates they lick as much for oil as they do for water. 
and collectively this suggests that Merkel cells are an essential contributor to detecting this uh, mouthfeel and in turn, loss with advanced age may alter preferences for related textures. So in conclusion, we found uh, collectively that oral surfaces are innervated by a variety of mechanosensory neurons, each with unique morphologies. In our functional studies, we found that the vast majority of tongue innervating mechanoreceptors respond best to moving stimuli. And when you think about how the uh, most tongue functions involve active movements, this really makes sense that the, the mechanosensory neurons within them would be um, tuned to detect uh, dynamic uh, stimulations rather than passive pressure sensing. We found that taking an unbiased approach to clustering neural responses was remarkably effective at distinguishing functionally distinct groups of neurons. And collectively, I think we've shown for the first time, to my knowledge, that tongue innervating mechanoreceptors are structurally, functionally, and molecularly distinct collectively, and in fact, are quite different from neurons that innervate other parts of the body. So this means that there is a lot of exciting work yet to be done here. We also find that mechanosensory neurons uh, innervating the oral regions simplify with aging, and that this dis disruption of mechanosensory neurons could impact food choice. So to wrap up, I'd like to thank my, thank my mentor, Ellen Lumpkin, who provided a phenomenal scientific home for me during my postdoc. So she's, been, she's also been exceptionally supportive of me in, um, throughout my career and through my transition to independence. I'd also like to thank her lab members um, who were collaborators on various aspects of this project, including Lucia, Ben, uh, and Chakun, as well as Rachel and, and others in the lab who have helped, um, who, are, who are fantastic sounding boards for ideas on this project. Um, I'd like to thank Sophie Obayashi in the Sense Lab at UC Berkeley for um, her help with calcium imaging analysis, our collaborators on different aspects of the project, including um, our colleagues in pathology and dentistry who helped with sample collection, um, our uh, David Yarmolinsky and Alexander Chessler's group who helped set up calcium imaging and analysis pipelines, uh, Greg Gerling and Sean Zhu who, are, who were instrumental in our um, in developing the clustering approaches to analyze in vivo data, um, as well as members of my own lab who are starting with me at Columbia and our funding sources. And thank you all for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yalda, for that insightful presentation. It was really great for you to give us an insight into all of the work that you've been doing. So I'm going to bring Yalda back. Hi, Yalda. Hello. Thanks so much again for your presentation. Thank you for having me. All right. So uh, another reminder for the audience, if you have a question you'd like to ask, you can submit it using the Ask a Question panel um, on the screen. We may not have time to cover everything during this session, but we'll be releasing a question and answer report within a few weeks. So please do stay tuned for that. Okay. So Yalda, the first question that I have for you, how do the functional categories of mechanoreceptors in the mouse tongue compare to what is known about humans? Yeah, this is a great question. So we know that in humans, as well as in mice, that most of the um, mechanosensory neurons are brush sensitive and have these kinds of transient responses. And so just like in humans, we see that in mice, um, the this, this, this same kind of distribution. And so we think that the reasoning behind this is that the tongue is constantly moving during, uh, during the tasks that it performs. And so it's not, uh, so, so the uh, mechanoreceptors that are present are equipped to kind of accommodate for these different types of movements. Awesome, great, thank you. Um, another question for you. Do mechanoreceptors that innervate the tongue from the um, geniculate ganglia show similar types of responses as the trigeminal ganglia? Uh, not completely. So there has been work out from Robert Bradley's lab where they've looked at uh, mechanoreceptors neurons and other neurons innervating the tongue from the geniculate ganglia. And what they mentioned is that these neurons are not pressure sensitive, but they are very brush sensitive. And so it might just be a subset of neurons that are similar, or they might be completely different. Awesome. Um, Dominique asks, where are the mechanoreceptors responsible for the gag reflex located? <laughs> 
Yeah, so these would all be in the back of the mouth. Um, so this isn't where we're, we're uh, probing in these studies. So these have been shown to be present in both the base of the tongue and in the pharyngeal walls. But uh, to my knowledge, the identities of these neurons haven't been, um, haven't been found yet. Okay, awesome. It looks like a, another potential topic to explore in the future for sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Gary asks, or he says, nice work. Um, do all trigeminal neurons express any or all of the following? And he lists uh, the TRIP-V1 or the NAV1.8 channel, any of those? Um, so not, they, they, subsets of trigeminal neurons express these. And so both uh, TRIP-V1 and NAV1.1, NAV or sorry, 1.8 are associated with nociceptors. And so they're in populations of neurons that are nociceptive um, as well as some other uh, populations. And so um, the TRIP-V1 in particular, we've started to investigate the expression of that in the tongue and have found interesting expression in both um, inside the, uh, the fungiform papilla taste buds, as well as inside the endoles of coisa and um, the uh, neurons that innervate the epithelia in filiform papilla. And so you can see some of that data in one of the resources that I uploaded from our bio um, that's up on bio archives right now. Awesome. Um, you talked a bit about, or you talked a lot about um, pressure. You talked about uh, temperature sensations. Um, Earl asks about itch. So you probably, did you test um, itchy chemicals such as histamine or are there any conditions associated with itch on the tongue? Um, I believe there are. We haven't tested these yet. Uh, so this would definitely be a, uh, a topic for future future discussion or for future studies. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Julia asks, uh, she's curious as to how you interpret the small proportion of force receptors. Um, she can see how that makes sense for swallow, but what about speech proprioception? The tongue can produce more force than what is required to produce, um, for example. Um, uh, can you comment perhaps on this? Sure. So the proprioceptors of the trigeminal ganglia, we or of, of the tongue, we wouldn't have actually recorded from these in our studies. These are uh, a completely separate nucleus that's um, actually within the, the brainstem. And so in our work, we would have only, we, we, would have, we would have missed these entirely if they're present. But I think um, one thing that we do see is that the hard palate is really densely innervated with these low threshold mechanoreceptors. And so we, that would sense pressure. And so we would expect that, you know, when the tongue is, um, generating speech, it also contacts those regions. And so the uh, hard palate regions might be more uh, critical in, in, generate, uh, in forming these types of speech patterns. OK, awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, were all the mice of your studies male? And would you expect to see a, a difference due to sex? Uh, they were not all males. So we tested both males and females in all of our studies. Um, we actually do kind of suspect that there might maybe a sex difference, but we haven't tested this directly yet. And I'm hoping to look at this more in the future. So in mice and humans, we see that females are a little bit more um, sensitive to touch. And in the Merkel cell knockout, the, uh, the only behavior that's really been published in um, the, uh, that's associated with glabrous skin or in hairy skin or glabrous skin is that um, is specific to females. And so they have a, uh, females have a, uh, preference for rough textures, and then this is ablated with um, the H one knockout, I believe. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, I guess uh, male-female differences are to be expected, just as you discussed, um, differences in age as well. Okay, we have a few more questions coming through here. Uh, let's see here. The tongue of mice presents filiform papillae with different morphologies. Did you analyze different regions like the filiform papillae of the medial region of the tongue body and the lingual prominence? And if so, are there differences in receptors of the different regions? We haven't done that yet. And this is partially due to uh, anato or just uh, technical limitations of the preparation. And so we can, in, in vivo, we can really only get to the um, anterior part of the tongue right now. So we haven't really gone back to the 
coastier regions, but we're hoping to kind of to figure out a way to look at this more clearly um, to answer this. Because I would I would expect that there would be a difference in uh, both the mechanoreceptors that are present in those areas. Awesome. Another question for you: Are motor and sensory neurons innervating the tongue? Um, somatotopically organized in the brain cortex? Oh my gosh, I don't have a good answer for that. I don't, I, the tongue is somatotopically organized, but I don't know if within the tongue those regions are, are somatotopic. Um, that, that's a great question. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, let's see, what is the capacity for plasticity in density of lingual mechanosensory neurons? For instance, if a behavioral intervention was used that resulted in differences in lingual stimulation, do you think there would be differences in density or response type post intervention? Yeah. Um, so we don't know. We don't have a good answer this for this yet for the for the oral cavity. In the skin, we can see that um, we see that with the hair cycle uh, that innervation changes and especially particularly in Merkel cells that Merkel cell density changes across the hair cycle. Um, but then in a central level, this is kind of accommodated for, so we don't see like huge differences in uh, perception with these changes. And so um, this is something that we'd have to look at later on or in future studies for the oral cavity. In your experiment, exper experiments looking at the diversity of trigeminal ganglion neurons, do you happen to look at whether the cell types you've identified, either by function or molecular markers, projected into distinct regions of the trigeminal nuclei in the brainstem? Each, for example, did uh, VGLUT3 plus neurons project into distinct regions of the spinal trigeminal nucleus or principal sensory nucleus? Not yet, but that's an excellent question. We're really excited to, do, to check that. So not just the spinal, spinal trigeminal nucleus, but there's some evidence that these also, um, that trigeminal neurons uh, innervating the oral cavity can also project uh, at or near the, uh, the NTS um, and that they can interface with um, neurons that uh, uh, sense, or they may interface with neurons that are um, involved in taste sensation. And so this is something that I'm very interested in looking at next. Awesome. Um, what about changes at the time of weaning? Do you predict that there would be any changes? How would you expect individuals who only suckle and have less taste variation as a result would be different? Yeah, um, I do expect changes. So in in mice, when they're born, they're they're uh, you know this innervation is not quite yet completely developed. Um, I would expect it, although I haven't seen any data yet to support it, that we would have different kinds of feeding style, or while these we have these different feeding styles from suckling to weaning to you know eating soft foods to becoming an adult that eats everything or many things, <laughs> that we would have kind of differences in sensitivity and structure that might accommodate these different styles and be more tuned for the types of foods that we eat. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um... Stephen asks, were there any changes in other solutions in the um, ATOH1 um, knockout mice? Uh, for example, in sugar solutions, uh, sodium chloride solutions, bitter solutions, et cetera? We haven't checked everything yet. We've looked at uh, polydextrose as well, and we see that, the, that they are equally as um, enthusiastic about drinking polydextrose in, well, in uh, control and, and knockout mice. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions here. So I'm going to keep going through the list here. Um, what is your opinion on the percentage of cold responding neurons obtained with the, uh, the, the in vivo G camp 6F method versus cold sensitive neurons from primary cultures of TG? One study is giving, for example, 14% for cooling down to 11 degrees Celsius, which would correspond to lower temperature in vivo, and then 83% cold sensitive neurons seems high. Yeah, so um, this is a great question, and it's um, one of the technical limitations that we have with doing GCAMP uh, studies is that we, we can't see all of the neurons that are present uh, that innervate the tongue, or not using these, these methods, we'd have to do some additional labeling. And so what we can, 
what we can see in these studies is just, uh, sorry, not just with GCAMP, but with doing in vivo imaging. And so what we can see are just the neurons that respond to any stimulation. And so when we apply the cold, so these studies applied cold versus pressure. And what you may have noticed is that the pressure response of neurons were, were not that, uh, it, compared to the brush, were not that common. And so we would basically be missing the neurons that are um, brush sensitive, which were a significant population, neurons that, were, that are heat sensitive, um, et cetera. And so when you add these up, it might skew the fraction, fraction a bit. And so, yeah, so that's a possibility there too. And also since our cold flow was flowing, these could also include some mechanoreceptors. So I wouldn't strictly say that these are cold, uh, cold sensitive neurons. Okay, perfect. Well, I think we're going to leave it at that. Thank you once again, Layalda, for your presentation today and for the answers to all of the, the questions uh, today. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining. This was really fun.